it's finished everyone so today I'm going to show you how I made my coronation crown hello everyone Sarah here from Sarah Humphrey embroidery welcome to my special coronation embroidery celebration video so if you've been following me on social media so Instagram and Facebook you may have already seen a few little clues about what this is and patrons and channel members have already had a little preview look at the crown so this is basically my version of the coronation crown worn at Charles III's coronation very recently May 23 if you're watching this in the future and this is made in stump work and gold work and I'm going to tell you all about how I made it so this isn't the only crown that you're going to see today we have got not one but three <laughs> three crowns to show you because I'm not the only one who's been making coronation crowns so we've got some contributions as well from Helen and Rebecca and I'm going to show you those shortly so let's just talk briefly about the crown and why it is we're all stitching this crown so this is St Edward's crown and it was used in the coronation for Charles II in 1661 and it was actually a replacement of one that had been melted down in 1649 so when the monarchy was abolished they got all the crown jewels and they melted them down and they took all the materials out of them basically and it's called St Edward's crown after Edward the Confessor so he is the king at the beginning of the Bayeux Tapestry if you're familiar with that it's made from solid 22 karat gold. I'm going to read this because I'm not going to remember <laughs> these statistics. It weighs 4.9 pounds, which is 2.23 kilograms. So that's, um, that's pretty heavy. Um, it currently has 444 precious gemstones on it. And that includes rubies, amethysts, sapphires, garnet, topaz and tourmaline. It has a velvet cap inside it and it has an ermine band and it was actually not used um, after 1689 for over 200 years um, basically due to the weight of it um, but George V revised, revived its use in 1911 so actually only seven monarchs have worn this crown for their coronation. You will see a lot of images of this currently though because a stylized design of this is used in coats of arms and other insignia so you may see it on a lot of the military cap badges and on post boxes and all sorts of places like that. So let's have a look at Helen's version of this crown. So Helen sent this to me and we actually had a little bit of a discussion on the email about how we might make this. Helen asked me for some advice and I said oh well I'm making one as well and we had a little bit of back and forth because it's really really complicated crown. When you look at it closely there is so much going on. The shapes are complex and the spaces in between the shapes as well. That might sound a bit strange but I'll talk about that a bit later and it's got so many jewels on it and none of them seem to match. There isn't an order to the colour or anything like that so they're all different and we were like well how can we make this we had a little bit of a discussion on it and this is how Helen has made hers and it's hard to tell on this but it's actually quite tiny it's only four by four inches so that's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters so it's pretty tiny and what I really love about this is how inventive Helen has been with her materials so she's reused lots of things and she's really made a recycled um, crown which is really of the moment Helen so we're well done with that one and I'm just going to read what she says about it um, so I said I didn't have any gold material or gold transfoil I used the gold wrapping this is the good bit from a block of marzipan and it held the stitches well she said so thankfully it didn't tear so well done marzipan <laughs> if you need some gold in an emergency go and buy some marzipan I would never have even thought of that so I just love to see other people's work when they come up with these brilliant ideas so Helen mainly used some beads from her stash. She did say she may have bought a few extra ones and I know that feeling quite well. She used some pearl pearl for the edging. Um, I used that as well in mine so we will talk about that shortly. And if I talk about some gold threads and metals in this that you're not familiar with and you think what the heck is she talking about? We will put a video up up here um, all about different gold metals and threads and you can see what they are um, and how to use those. So the gold ball on the top is a pearl from a broken pearl necklace and that actually belonged to Helen's mum so that's a really nice connection in there and she has dipped it in a PVA glue and then gold a leaf dust so it's actually proper gold on it with a pearl underneath and I quite like that little story there and she says I'm sure my mum would approve of this upcycling. I think we all approve of this upcycling Helen. She's used fake fur for the ermine that her friend's mum had donated and the diamonds in the centre of the crown were taken from a jumper uh, which they were falling off 
And the gold balls were originally on a Christmas decoration. So Helen's just been super inventive with the materials. What have I got lying around? What could I use? This is such a unique design. You don't use normal embroidery materials, but if you can sew over it or stick it on or somehow attach it, if it's got a hole through it, then you can use it for embroidery. So you just have to have a little bit of imagination. So Helen thinks this took about three weeks to complete. She said she didn't count the actual hours in it, um, but she was really pleased with the end result. And she said she's definitely made with this love, this with love. And Helen joined a stitching group recently. And this is the first piece that she's actually entered, which is pretty awesome. So if you're going to start with this, Helen, <laughs> you've made a bit of a rod for your own back now because you've got to match this every time. So I'm sure they'll be super impressed with it. It is really stunning. Um, well done on a fantastic piece and for upcycling all of those amazing materials. So we're going to have a look at Rebecca's coronation piece now. Now if you saw my video on stump work, so the second one we did with the dragonflies in and you all sent me some pieces of your work and we had a little look through them, Rebecca's piece was the beautiful piece with all the little lovely animals on it. it had the owl in the tree and the butterflies and the little snake in the grass and Rebecca did that so she has done this one as well and she does say, I'm just going to read this out because this resonates with me, um, well at last I finished my coronation embroidery, I started with good intentions to have it finished in time for the day but as usual events overtook me um yeah same for me Rebecca I didn't get mine finished for the day either so it's a good job they weren't waiting for me to make a crown because they wouldn't have got it and Rebecca has done um, a slightly different crown so Rebecca has done the Tudor crown not the St Edward's crown with the King Charles cipher underneath so the Tudor crown, um, not a lot is known about it because it doesn't exist anymore, but there are written records of it and they think it was probably commissioned by Henry the Seventh or Henry the Eighth. Um, and we do know that both Ch James I and Charles I were known to have worn this crown. That is in the records. And it was also broken up following the abolition of the monarchy. So again, we only have those records that we know about it, but we do know that it weighed more than the St Edward's crown, actually coming in at seven pounds and six ounces, which was a whopping 2.8 kilograms. So Rebecca has used some different materials for her crown. So she has used some gold leather for it, some foiled gold leather for the crown and um, in the letters as well. She's got an outline of pearl pearl, and I think that's a Japanese thread as well around those letters just to make them stand out and give them a really nice edge. And we do have a video on lots of these gold work techniques. So do check out our gold work playlist if you're interested in those. And I think I can see some plate as well in there. So for the third, King Charles III, I think those are pieces of plate ribbon so it's like a ribbon made out of a metal and the lettering is also padded underneath so it's got the leather on top and underneath there's some layers of felt and that gives it a curve and that helps to catch the shine of the leather and make them look really three-dimensional and I know from doing this technique this is some really complex layering um, going on here because these letters actually overlap and the R goes over the top of the C and underneath the C at the same time. So you really have to think about what order you work things in and where you start and stop your padding and how high it is depending on what's on top of what and where you do your gold first and where you do it last. So there's an awful lot going on in those letters. So the stitching on the crown is definitely work worth a closer look as well because that red looks like velvet but it isn't velvet it's actually long and short stitching in there and this has been shaded to look like velvet so it's done been done with embroidery thread in a couple of colors and shaded so you can see those folds of the velvet so that's really super clever Rebecca well done with that one you really have to look closely to see that it's not it's not velvet and the ermine is also stitched so that is a turkey rug stitch really fun three-dimensional stitch we have a video on that and if you want to go and learn turkey rug stitch as well and then the crown is embellished with what looks like actual jewel <laughs> Rebecca I don't know if you've got some real ones from somewhere but I can see some beads on there as well and some pearls too lots of sumptuous materials on this it's a lot of fun to make one of these crowns and see if you can get all of these materials in there um, and the actual crown is just bling from head to toe just just covered in so much golden jewel so you've no risk of putting too many jewels in there so you can just have a lot of fun with these I'm also interested to see how Rebecca has tackled the top of this because there's a smaller cross on the top and it's actually quite a difficult shape to make this and I think Rebecca has done this if I am right out of a sequin looks like you've got some large gold sequins and actually cut that cross shape out of the sequin which is quite ingenious because I did struggle with that I'll talk about that in a bit as well so a um, brilliant solution there Rebecca um, it's really stunning thank you so much for sharing with us and showing off your stitching skills 
Okay, so why did I decide to make mine three-dimensional? <laughs> well, a couple of things really. We've been doing a lot of stump work videos recently, so I've kind of got 3D stump work in my head anyway. We've been looking at all of that sort of thing in the last few videos and the coronation was coming up and everyone was getting quite excited about it. There was lots on the TV about it. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if I could make an actual crown, a little version of a crown. I thought, I wonder if I can. And I don't get many opportunities to have a go at something a little bit more complex. We have to do them quite quickly to get things filmed. So it's often a little bit simpler. And I thought this would be a really interesting test of my skills. I haven't used them for a long time. So let me see if I can make one of these crowns. I do want to mention at this point, because I know somebody will ask, and in fact, somebody has already asked without even seeing it, is this going to be a kit or a lesson? It isn't going to be any of those, I'm afraid. I'm not going to make this into a kit. We're not going to do a class on it. It's just way too complicated to work out. It took me long enough just to get the thing together without having to sit and write instructions as well. It was really just a little bit of fun for me to have a go and see if I could make this. So I do hope you enjoy watching this. I will explain as much as I can about how I made it. So all of my designs and all of my planning starts in my sketchbook. So I'm going to show you that now. So this is my sketchbook page. I only did one page for this just to get my ideas down. And the crown is already designed. I didn't need to design a crown. It's already done. So I studied the actual one closely, not the actual one, a picture of the actual one. Um, it is on display, I think, in at the Tower of London. If you want to go and see the crown jewels, you can see it there. But there's loads of images on the internet and I had a really good look at it to see how it is made and it's actually as I've mentioned really really complicated the uh, the shapes in it are quite confusing there's lots of elements to it and it goes up and over and there's something inside it and a little bit on the top so it was quite complicated so I had a little drawing of it here so I just did this one first so this was a rough how it's actually constructed sometimes you think you know what a crown looks like and when you actually look at the one you want to do it doesn't look anything like that so I just got the elements here so it's basically got this big band around the middle that goes over your head. It's got the ermine along the bottom and then it's got four fleur-de-lis and four crosses on it. I did check the number of those and it's got these two arches. So the arches go over the top. Now they're not straight over. They've got this interesting shape and they sort of go down a bit in the middle. So I had to think about that as well. Big gold ball on the top there and then another cross on the top of the gold ball. So it's got all of those elements. So I drew those first just to make sure that I was understanding what the how the crown was constructed. I just drew this crown as a drawing but I actually decided it was quite a good size really. I don't want to do a full size one. It will take me till the next coronation to do that. So I thought I actually written on it, look, this is a good finished size. So it's approximately that size. It's actually a little bit bigger than that. And then I put make a paper template to test the fitting and size. Just write down all your notes and all your ideas so that if you forget something or you want to go back later. And if I did want to ever make another one, I could think, oh, how did I do it? OK, make a paper one. That's a really good idea. And just date it as well. It's always worth doing just for copyright purposes. So if we just move down, I then tried to draw the fleur de lis by far the hardest bit to draw with the fleur-de-lis and if you look the fleur-de-lis up there's lots of variations on it and I thought I've got to actually stitch this and I've got to cut it out as well so I need the simplest fleur-de-lis that I can manage so I tried it a few times and you can see how much I struggled with it I tried putting a grid in it as well I thought does that work draw half of it if you're doing um a symmetrical pattern it's always worth doing half flipping it over and tracing the other half so they look the same so I had a few goes at that without too much success and then I thought I'll draw the band out here I'll draw the whole band and look at where the stones come in relation to the crosses and the fleur-de-lis and each one has got one underneath it so then I tried to space them out evenly so you can see how I'm just trying to work out this design now I suppose in hindsight I could have maybe printed it off and just traced one you only need one cross and one fleur-de-lis because it just repeats itself but it was a good drawing exercise actually and it um yeah, it was good for me to learn how to draw these flipping fleur de lis because they were quite difficult. And then I've just put a couple of ideas here about how I would do some of the different elements. So I've got a sort of rough plan. I know there's four of each and they alternate. So I have to think as well about how they're going to join up. 
when I come to make it three dimensional. And then this is the um, the two arches that go over the top. So a kind of view from the top. So I'm making something in 3D now. I can't see it all flat. I have to move around the shape a little bit. So these are the two arches and then the gold ball in the middle, which is this bit over here, which has got quite a lot of detail in it for quite a small bit. So the gold ball and then another cross on the top as well. So I had a close look at that to see what was involved in that and then I've actually written down as well the materials used in the original crown not that I was going to use those materials but that just helps you to choose the materials you want to use so like Helen's used her marzipan gold so we know that we're going to need something gold something to represent the gold and um, so I've got gold and ermine and velvet and gemstone so I know that I'm going to need to at least make it look like that even if I don't use those actual materials so I've got some rough idea of what I'm doing. I know the elements that I need to do. So now I need to refine it a little bit more and I need an actual design that I can embroider on because I can't stitch from this one here. So this is what I did next. So I drew out the band. Come to that bit in a minute. So I did this on a piece of graph paper, by far the easiest if you're doing something, again, that needs a bit of symmetry and it always got some straight lines and it gives yourself a bit of a structure to work on. It's much easier. And you can see how many times I've sort of rubbed this out and redrawn it and tidied it up and neatened it a little bit. And once you've got one fleur de lis, you can just trace it and repeat it so you know that they are all the same. So I planned this out and then I just copied that on a photocopier and I actually cut this out and I bent it round and thought what size does this look like so I'm going to bring this in at this point so this is my little maquette if you like just my little model of it just to see what it's going to look like in three dimensions so that is this just cut out I cut two strips just for the arches at the top and then there's a little bit of calico inside here and I just made a circle out of it, ran a running stitch around the edge of it and pulled it up and put some stuffing in it so that will represent the velvet cap that goes inside and just that little model gives me a really good idea of what's involved and what size everything is going to come out and how I'm going to actually construct it now because I know I've got to bend these for example in the top and I know I've got to join it here so just doing that little model was definitely worth doing and I did refer to that quite a lot. So let's talk a little bit about the materials that I used. So I did also look around for things that I'd already got. I was on a little bit of a time limit anyway, which is, by the way, a good way to make something. Because if you've got as long as you need, then you just take as long as you need and it often doesn't get finished. So it was quite good to do that. I've got quite a lot of stash of materials and I thought I will manage with what I've got. I could have sourced some things that maybe were more appropriate for it, but again, that would have taken time. So I just used what I had. So I'm going to show you some of the things that I used. So I decided for the the band around the head that I was going to use violin. So I know I need something stiff to form the shape of that and I could use fabric and layers but then I've got edges to finish off and that was all another layer of trickiness that maybe I didn't need and I've used violin before and if you see my little gold elephant video on my Sarah Humphrey Creates channel and I show you how I designed that from scratch and I use violin for that and it's an interesting fabric so normally this is palmet violin by the way normally you would use this to make curtains so the stiff bit that goes across the top of some curtains and um, that's what goes inside this but it doesn't have a weave to it it's a sort of fiber that's kind of I don't know how they make it glued together or somehow uh, bonded together but it doesn't have a warp and a weft so it is quite interesting to stitch on once you make a hole in it you've made a hole in it really you can't close it up so you don't want to do too much and um, picking on this so I thought I would make the band out of that if I just bring that back in talk about that in a minute Ooh, ginger cats getting more comfortable so this band here so I decided to make that out of the vel the violin and then just in case the violin shows through because it's white and I didn't want white, I painted it with gold. So I've got some gold here. This is just a fabric paint. This one's by Dylon, but there are other people that make fabric paints and it's just a gold fabric paint. And you can actually set this so you can paint your fabric with it. And if you iron it, it will set the color into it. So it does take the fabric does take this color really well and I thought then that's just got a gold background so if anything does show through it's not going to be really obvious like the white so I did paint this background first so 
This is my pricking. So this is the prick and pouch design transfer method. We've got a video on how to do this. This is a really ancient way, a very accurate way of transferring a design. So all you do is trace it onto the tracing paper, make some holes in it. In fact, you see it better if I do that. Rub some powder through it and then the little dots appear onto your surface and you can join the little dots up. So I painted it gold. I prick and pounced the design onto the gold and then I drew that in with just a, a black pen so I could see my design on there um, ready for stitching. It was always worth spending the time on the preparation because the next bit is easier because now I have to stitch that really awkward shape so I've got a cross alternating with a fleur-de-lis and another cross so it's really complicated shape and I wanted to put the outline in first so what I've used is what's called some pearl pearl so that is a gold work wire that again is in that video that I mentioned earlier if you want to know more about that and I've been around the whole of the outline of the band with this pearl pearl so this is going to make the finished shape and I'm going to work within that and then I need to cut around that first so the pearl pearl went down first and then I decided I would put the jewels in next and I wanted the whole thing to be really gold and sparkly so I knew I was going to work some chipping in there which is a good way of filling in some areas with some gold um, but I thought I'll get the jewels in first and then I can work the chipping around it chipping takes quite a while the less that you have to do of that the better <laughs> really so I put the jewels in first I'm just going to show you what I've used for the jewels so I've got my imitation jewels out of my bead box. I've got quite a good selection of beads, so I was fairly confident that I would have something in there. And I found these little square ones. So good representation. Remember, you're trying to make something look like something else. It doesn't have to actually be it. And there are lots of different jewels in the crown, and they're all different colours, and they all seem to be different shapes. It's, it's a bit of a mad thing, really. So these had some nice colours in them, and I've got some purple and pink ones in there. So I thought I'll use those for the jewels. And then I thought it needs some... Uh, diamonds around it. Now I didn't have any diamonds to hand so I thought I'll use some silver beads. I thought yeah I've got some silver beads and when I dived in my box I thought I'll pull the silver out. I didn't have anything. <laughs> I just don't have silver beads for some reason and so I gave Jonathan a job and I had a pot full of mixed beads. <laughs> mixed colours and there were some silver ones in there and I gave him the little box of them and I gave him some tweezers and I said can you pull out all the silver beads so he very obligingly did that for me and I found enough silver beads to use so you can always find something around and if I'd had a little bit more time I could have bought some but I managed we had enough um, from doing that so I put the silver beads around the edge of these jewels and I will show you this crown up in detail so you think oh, I can't see what you're talking about I will show you it, um, the whole thing in detail at the end so you can have a good look at these things I've talked about so they went on for the jewels and then it's actually got a row of sort of looks like gold balls along the bottom and um, I had some gold beads that I found. It didn't have anything quite right for that but I found these large gold beads and I thought these will work well for that and what I actually did with them is I put a wire up the middle of them so I put them onto the wire and then couched over them so it would bend. This I knew was going to have to go round in a curve like this and join up and I just sort of wanted it to keep that structure really and I thought the bees on their own aren't going to do that if I put a wire down the middle they will hold the shape so it actually has um, this little wire down the middle this is a cake making wire this is gold wire that we use for stump work and that went down the middle of these larger beads quite nicely I knew that that would help me later on to have a little bit of structure and then I've used some of these pretend pearls as well in there too so just a little bit of a mixture of different beads I've got some red seed beads in there as well um, and a few other bits and bobs in there so I got those and I used those beads throughout for the jewels so once I put the jewels in place, which I just sewed down with an ordinary sewing cotton, I've got my pearl pearl edging and I've got my beaded band along the bottom, then it was just time to do all of that chipping. So chipping is done with a bright check pearl, another kind of embroidery gold wire. And you just basically cut it up and put it down like lots of little beads. That bit took forever took forever and my fingers were getting really sore and the needle was going in the end of my fingers um, but it did create that beautiful sparkly gold effect so it was well worth doing so I did that in the whole of the band and then I made the arches in the same way so the two arches are separate I took the size of them off this and I measured this from over the top around the curve 
and down to the other side and I measured the two of those so those were made separately and I did them exactly the same way so the gold beads on the edge with the wire through it and the jewels in the middle which were the, the glass beads and then I put the chipping around those so all of those elements were made separately so I made everything separately um, so in stump work Ginger cat's going. So in stump work, you make all your elements and then you put them together and you see it come together at the end. So this was exactly the same um, from that point of view. So I've made my band, I've made my two arches, and then I needed to think about the ermine. Now I did think about Rebecca's idea of doing the turkey rug stitch for the ermine. You can make it really nice and fluffy, especially if you do it in a wall. It is a long um, process to stitch turkey rug stitch it can take a long time to do and I was trying to get this finished for the actual day which I didn't manage in the end but um, I went down an easier route so I went and had a look around my local shop with some fabric in it and I came up with this so this is just a fleece just a white fleece fabric but I thought it's on a small scale it's not quite furry enough but because of the scale of it it will do the, the do the job basically it will look like the right thing here so I bought some of this white fleece and then when I cut it it curled up nicely and I thought oh perfect I can just roll that up like so and then I've just put some black dots on it and I'm going to tell you all my trade secrets here I'm not going to keep the, any of this secret because just to show you that you need to think out of the box a bit so the black dots are done with a sharpie pen and there may be people gasping all over the land when they say I put gold work and sharpie pens next to each other but you know sometimes needs must and I thought what's going to look more like the black part of it it's actually in the fur the black it's not on top so I couldn't add anything on so I thought I'll just put it literally a dot along the um the fleece to make it look like the ermine so that's all I've done for that and you can see that I had a practice run I haven't done practice runs for everything in it because I'm sort of confident with the goal but if you're not sure do do try it I talk about this so much in my videos about doing little samplers and trying things out so you don't do it on the final one and you come to put the dots on and it's all gone wrong so um, I did do a little practice run on that with the dots and just to work out how much fleece I needed to go around it so that was the ermine and then there was just the cap left and the top, talk about the top in a second because it got the cap next. So I've got some purple velvet and all I did with that was cut a circle for it, run a running stitch around the edge of it and pulled that up. And I've actually, I'll just show you this, stuffed it with a little form inside. Now anybody from the UK will laugh at this a little bit because if you are familiar with Blue Peter... The very famous children's program ran for years and years and years and everybody watched it, everybody knows about Blue Peter and they would make stuff, it was live TV and they'd make stuff and it always had toilet rolls in it, they always made things out of toilet rolls and I thought this is no different, I'm going to put a toilet roll in my coronation crown but it was perfect just to make a form, just to go inside here like this just wanted something for the velvet to fit around just to make a nice form so it isn't going to fall out so this happened to be the perfect size I've just put a little bit of wadding inside it in the top just to again give it some structure and then I've cut my purple piece of velvet over the top gathered the edge and it gathers underneath here it actually gathers around the bottom I can show you that in a second and that's the form that the velvet top goes around. So you just have to think about structure. How can I make something stand up? How can I make it a little bit more secure when I'm stitching it? So the last piece that I had to think about was the little cross on the top and the ball. And this was by far the hardest part of the whole thing for some reason. And um, I had to enlist some more help with this one. So Jonathan's come on board with this one and he actually made the gold ball for me. I was trying to find a bead the right size that I could uh, paint gold and I couldn't find one. So Jonathan's made one out of some modeling clay and he has sprayed that gold and he also made the little dangly bits on the side because he didn't have any beads that were suitable for that and the cross is the same as the cross that I used in the band but it's a little bit smaller and just making it that tiny bit smaller just suddenly made the whole thing so much more difficult <laughs> and you have to see it from both sides there's one cross in the middle and it's the same on both sides so I actually did it opened out I did two kind of back to back I stitched them separately cut them out folded them in half um, and then sewed a purple around the edge of it and filled it with the chips and the jewels so it was made in the same way but it was just super small and I just had to make this thing that were two dimensions and I could fold them together and um, I did nearly lose the plot I did nearly 
throw the whole thing out the window at this point it was getting so fiddly to do um, but I did manage it and we managed to fit the little gold beads on that Jonathan had made as well to go on the top so he's drilled a hole through the middle of the ball and I put um, another piece of that gold wire I showed you earlier inside it so I just bent that over and formed the cross around the gold wire and then the two ends of the gold went through the bead they went through the top of the arches and they just twisted underneath to hold the whole thing together so it's quite a lot of structural things going on it you've really got to think on your feet a little bit and I hadn't tried these things out it was just I've got to get this crown finished this is going to work and I just made it work so I got all the elements so then it was a case of putting it all together so I'm going to get the crown off the shelf now and I'm just going to talk through how I assembled it and you'll be able to see some of those elements that I have been talking about. So here she is. So where should we start? So um, let's look at the band. So you can see the jewels here with the chips in between them. So it just makes that beautiful gold sparkle with my silver beads very carefully counted that by Jonathan around the edge here and I just left a little bit of violin on the bottom to fix this band of ermine um, too and I've just stitched through that underneath there where I rolled it up there's a joint you can stitch it to the violin quite nicely so that went on the bottom so I had to allow extra for that and then the arches went on the top and these bits were quite complicated so I had to sort of attach the whole thing together first so the little cross there went through the bead and through oh, that's come off and I'll explain why that's come off in a second and went through the two arches so I had to find the middle of the two arches and it's gone through both and I've just untwisted the wires on the other side I did actually put a bit of glue on that to hold that in place then I had to shape these arches and they've got the wire down the beads don't forget so that was fairly easy to shape I could just bend them into shape and they stayed and then they fastened to the top of the crosses here so they actually go behind the crosses so there's a little bit more of the violin there that I haven't stitched on and I've just cut it into a point so you can't see it behind the cross and um, I've actually glued that in place. I could have probably sewn it on if I thought about the construction a little bit beforehand, um, but I have glued those into place and just let them set and it was actually quite a nice structure there. And then I'll talk about the purple in a minute. So we're just gonna go back to this. So I'm just gonna turn that over. As you can see, it's on the same on both sides. So that was the two that have been folded over and sewn together. And then it does have, this ball has a band of jewels around it because there's not enough jewels on this thing let's put some more on and I was just like oh am I going to do that and I managed one row of them and it does actually have some over the top as well which I didn't have time for in the end and I thought you know that one row is fine and they are just balanced on there I could just glue those in place but they do just fit around there quite nicely and they're just going to stay there I think if I don't handle it too much which I'm not going to so that's just got a wire through it and that is just resting um, over the gold ball there and then I just want to show you underneath so here's my purple velvet so just a big circle of velvet don't want to damage the top so hopefully you can see inside there there's the blue Peter toilet roll <laughs> sometimes they just you know you need to put toilet roll in it it's a perfect thing to use then use it there's a little bit of stuffing inside that just gives a little bit of form to this purple on on the outside and you can see the gathers around there and that all just sits in there quite nicely so if I needed to repair it or I needed to just um, have a little look inside I can just pull that purple out it's not fastened in it's just sitting in there nicely nice and snug and I'll just show you the join actually here is the join so these two ends of it are folded back on each other and I've just sewn down there. You couldn't get a perfect join, but it's not too bad. It could have done with one more bead on it, I think, but that's that's the back and that's the join and a pretty good join there on the ermine too. So I just turn it over so you can see it. So I will put again this up at the end. You can have a little look at that going round and round. So that is my crown. So let's put it back on the shelf. So it's quite fragile in the state that it's in at the moment. It's got some very delicate parts on it. So I really want to cover it up. And I found this really great dome. That's the bottom of it there. And this is the top. 
really nice glass dome and it fits in it perfectly this came from ikea by the way if you've got an ikea near you they have lots of really interesting display things and occasionally i just grab one if i see it and i think that'll be good for something and it turned out it has so the dome is going to go on the top of that and that will just keep that protected and i can look at it without having to handle it and touch it and it will keep the dust off it as well so i just thought i'd finish with a little roundup of how I think this project went and what I got out of it um, and the first point being that it took longer than I thought it was going to take. Everything always takes longer than you think it's going to take. Do take that into consideration and in a way because I hadn't planned it so much I was doing working it out a bit as I went along I didn't know how long those bits were going to take and it took a lot longer to finish it off than I anticipated the chips took a long time but then to get it all together and make sure it all looked correct and how am I going to display it and that little cross on the top um, that nearly finished me off they all took a lot longer than anticipated so even though I did it nice and small anticipating that um, it still did take longer so if I were to do it again, there are a few changes that I would make probably in the way I constructed it with the arches. I made them a tiny little bit too long and I had to break some beads off. So that would have been worth doing a little sampler of just a little bit more than the paper one using the paper one, you know, actually cut one from some vile put it on and try it just to make sure it's right. So I did take a few shortcuts and that never works. Don't take shortcuts. Um, but I think also as well, if you're making something and you are going to make two of them for some reason, then you always learn from the first one and take what you learned from the first to the second time, because I find that you can nearly always improve on something. I would also, if I made it again, find some different materials. I think it's nice to use what you have. You have a big stash of stuff and you want to get through. You don't want to keep piling stuff into the stash and never using it. So it was nice to see how can I make it out of the things I've got. But there are also some lovely sort of gemstones and, and um, faux gemstones, if you like, that I could have used on it that might have made it just a little bit more sparkly and a little bit more special. And the gold balls around the bottom as well. Um, Helen's idea of those Christmas decorations was ingenious. Um, so you just have to think outside the box a little bit and see what you can find. So I think I would probably spend a little bit more time sourcing some different materials, um, but I did enjoy um, looking around and seeing what I could use and seeing if I could make it work with those. I did really enjoy having a go at making something a little bit more complex as well. On the apprenticeship that I did, you, we learned things in um, very, very small detail and we did things to a very high standard. And sometimes I think I've forgotten how to do that. I think, could I actually do that again? So it was nice to have a go with this and see what I could still do and what I was still capable of doing. Um, and I did really enjoy it. I think it came out pretty good. I'm quite pleased with how it came out. And don't forget as well, I've mentioned before, this is handmade. You're making something handmade made you don't want it to look like it's come off a machine so these little handmade details are really beautiful and you should embrace those so I hope you found that interesting, that insight into how I made my goldwork coronation crown. If you're interested in the goldwork embroidery technique and you'd like to know more about that, you can check out our goldwork playlist up here in the corner. And I would like to thank Helen and Rebecca for sharing their really beautiful goldwork coronation crown pieces with me. And if you've enjoyed the video, do give it a thumbs up as always. And I will see you next time. I know what I'm doing. <laughs>